Hallelujah. Let's bless the Lord on this Sunday morning. Is he worthy, church? Hallelujah.
on us this morning. Oh God, we need you. I need thee. How I need thee, Lord. Come and have your way. Come and have your way, oh God. Spirit of the living God, full of fresh. Come on, if you're thirsty, dry and you need a fresh touch of God's presence. Come on, lift up your hands and lift up your voice. Come on, if you're hungry for more of Him, come on, reach out. Reach up to heaven this morning. Oh, God, we need you. I need thee, Lord. Oh, church sing his praises. He inhabits the praises of his people. Oh, hallelujah. Lord, 
Lord, I thank you for a fresh touch of your presence. Lord, I thank you for life. God, I thank you for peace of mind. Right now, in the mighty name of Jesus, I thank you for perfect peace. Lord, may the voice of the enemy be silenced at the presence of the Savior. In the presence of the King, may the voice of doubt and fear be put to shame. Oh, in the presence of the King. Lord, I thank you for peace of mind. I thank you for healing in your presence. Thank you for joy in your presence, Jesus. Lord, stir up your gifts among your people. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me.
Come on, lift up his name this morning. He is worthy. He is worthy. Oh. Come on, lift up a radical praise to him this morning. We bless you, Jesus. We praise your name. ushers to come forward. We're going to take an offering break and then we'll get back into it. Y'all ready this morning? Come on, is God good? Has he been faithful in your life? He's been faithful in my life. Hallelujah. Come on, let's honor him and worship him with our tithes and offerings this morning as the ushers come. I don't know about you, but you can't outgive God. He's proven himself faithful time and time and time and time again. So, Reverend Dr. Michael Clark, will you come and lead us in the offering this morning as we... The privilege, I thank God for the privilege of giving, for the pleasure of fellowship. He's got more than you do, so you can't outgive him. He's more generous than most of us do. <laughs> Oh, I thank God he gave us the scriptures. Luke 6, 38. Give, and it shall be given unto you a good, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, shall men give into your bosom. God won't drop money out of heaven. He's not a counterfeiter. He'll put it on people's hearts to be good to you, and you walk in his favor if you do his commandments. Amen. Father, I thank you for every cent being given today. I thank you for every heart willing to give. God, give it back to them abundantly, exceedingly, above all they can think or ask. In Jesus' name, amen. Death could not hold you down. You are the risen King, seated in majesty, seated Sing hallelujah. He has won the victory.
we thank you, God, for that victory. You're the risen King. Hallelujah. You may be seated this morning. Come on, as you find your seat, tell somebody we have victory in Jesus. Good morning, everybody. We'll save our video announcements for the end, and we'll put them on Facebook, too. All right. Good morning, good morning, good morning. I'm going to be in two different chapters of the Bible again today. I did it last week. I'm starting to have it. I'm going to be in Matthew 21 and John chapter 2. While you're turning to uh, those chapters, I'm going to start in Matthew 21 while you're finding that. Uh, next Sunday is Palm Sunday. It's also Baptism Sunday. Woohoo! All right. Some of y'all excited about that. I'm glad. Baptism is something worth getting excited about. Baptism is a way to go public with your faith in Jesus. It is soaking wet proof that you've made commitment to follow Jesus. Baptism is a beautiful thing. When you go under the water, it represents that you've died to your old life. You've died to a life of sin. And when you come out of the water, it represents you've been raised to new life in Christ Jesus. So if you have not been baptized, if you are concerned that you have not been baptized, <laughs> sign up because we're going to do that next Sunday. Put it on your red card. You can sign up through the church app, which some of you guys did this week. I love it. Awesome. And uh, we will get you baptized next Sunday during our Sunday morning service. Service. All right, Matthew chapter twenty-one, verses twelve through seventeen. I got a short message today. Um, my message is brief, and that's a good thing. You beat the Methodist and McCalls. Matthew twenty-one. 12. Then Jesus went into the temple of God and drove out all those who bought and sold in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold. So Jesus kicked over the tables and he kicked over the seats of the dove sellers. He turned over the tables and the chairs. Uh huh. And he said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer. But you have made it a den of thieves. Somebody say thieves. 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 Then the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying out in the temple, the children, not the old folks, not the grown-ups, but the children were crying out in the temple saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Church folks were indignant. And they said to him, do you hear what these are saying? And Jesus said to them, yes, have you never read out of the mouths of babes and nursing infants you have perfected praise? Then he left them and went out of the city to Bethany and he lodged there. Let's pray. God, I thank you that we serve a risen Savior. That we serve the King of kings and the Lord of lords. That we serve the King of victory. And God, we thank you that through the victory of Jesus Christ, we have victory. That we have overcome the world because Jesus overcame the world. And Lord, help us, God, to be overcomers today. God, as we follow this road to Calvary that Jesus walked, help us, God, to learn these truths and to walk them out every day, God, that we would walk in victory. Victory over sin. Victory over the world. Victory over the flesh. Victory over death. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We're continuing our series called The Road to Calvary. And we're following the last week of the life of Jesus leading up to the cross. Week one, we looked at the scandal of Luke chapter 9 because as soon as Jesus set out for his journey to Jerusalem, he was met with the racism of the Samaritans. So week one, week, week one we learned the power of forgiveness. Last week, we looked at the miracle Jesus did on the road from Jericho to Jerusalem. He healed a man named Bartimaeus. We learned the power of faith in God. We learned that nothing can stop somebody who's hungry for God. 
You get hungry for God, you are unstoppable. God said, draw near to me and I will draw near to you. You can take God at his word. That means that you are as close to God as you want to be. Today, we're looking at some Monday mayhem that Jesus caused in the temple courts. Does anybody here, I'm doing a little survey, does anybody here have a loud relative? Come on, you know who I'm talking about. They're about 10 times louder than the rest of the family. Uh, some of y'all like waving your hands like you know exactly. Y- y'all know, like, like they cause a scene in public and they don't mean to. They just talk so loud that everybody in the restaurant turns their head and looks. Yeah, I have a loud relative, and I love her, but she's just so stinking loud. I mean, she's about as subtle as a dump truck in a nitroglycerin factory. Okay, true story. I have seen it happen, and others have seen it happen, too. Okay, the, the, this loved one of mine, she, she is so loud. I don't know if y'all are like me. Sometimes when I run into the store, I want to run in, get what I need, and get out of there. Y'all like that? I'm like that sometimes, okay? And if, and if I see y'all, I love you, but I ain't going to take time to talk to you because I'm on a mission, okay? I've got to accomplish the mission. I've got to get in, get out, and go home and eat my Doritos. You know what I mean? Like priorities, right? So, so, but anyway, the, 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 this relative of mine, she has a way of disrupting people like that. She is a mission interceptor. And I've seen it, and I know others have seen it. Okay, I've witnessed this in a grocery store. I've seen somebody, a friend of mine, come in that I could tell they were in a hurry to get some groceries and get out of there. But she walks in. She says, oh, hey, I see you over there. And she causes a scene, and they have to stop, and she holds them hostage talking to them for about 30 minutes. <laughs> Loud. One day when I was a kid, she took me and my brother and my cousins, who took us out to lunch one day, and we were sitting at the pizza restaurant, and we were sitting at the window, and there was a wreck right outside the window, right there on the street, and she jumped up. She said, oh, in the name of Jesus, Lord, touch him. Be with him right now. Help him, Jesus. And the whole restaurant, everybody was looking. If you're loud... Be proud. Because that's a gift. Because God gives some people that special gift, that special ability to transform the atmosphere when you walk into the room. And here's the deal with Jesus. When Jesus steps into a place, he changes the atmosphere. When Jesus walks into a room, he changes the dynamics of of the room when jesus walked into a wedding reception the water became wine when jesus walked into a funeral procession in the city of nain he put the funeral home out of business because a little boy started banging on the coffin let me out When Jesus steps into a place, he changes. I don't know about you. I remember when Jesus stepped into my life and he changed the atmosphere. I remember when he stepped into my hospital room and he changed the atmosphere. I remember when he stepped into the kitchen when we were looking at the bills trying to figure out how we were going to pay them. And he changed the atmosphere. When Jesus steps into the room, he changes things. Some of you, you don't need more money. You don't need more medication. What you need is more of the presence of the Savior in your life right now. You need Jesus in the room because he changes things. Some of y'all, like me in the grocery store, you try to slip into church and slip out of church and you're keeping your head down because you're hiding from Jesus. But Jesus sees you. He says, hey, I see you over there. 
Because he wants to step into your world and transform it. When Jesus shows up, he brings his love and he brings his mercy and he brings the peace of God. God that passes understanding when anybody else who's going through what you're going through would lose their mind. When you can't hold yourself together, Jesus will hold you together. Because Jesus shows up and he changes things. And the temple in Jerusalem was no exception. Jesus stepped into the temple courts and he changed the whole dynamic. Why was Jesus in Jerusalem? Ultimately, he was there to lay down his life. We learned that in the first week of this series, right? Going back to week one, Luke 9, 51. As the time drew near for him to ascend to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. So Jesus made it his mission to go to Jerusalem to accomplish the will of God. Jesus came to pay the price for sinful humanity. God demonstrates his love for us in this, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. None of us deserved it. Yet Jesus came to lay down his life for us. That's why Jesus came. That was his mission. That was his purpose. That was his calling. Jesus was born to die for you and me. That's why Jesus was in Jerusalem. But why was everybody else in Jerusalem? Because it was the week of Passover. And I'm going to get a little Sunday school, Bible school this morning for just a minute. But there are three Jewish festivals, according to the Old Testament, where every devout Jew had to make the trip to Jerusalem to worship. Passover, Pentecost, and the Feast of Tabernacles. Passover in the spring, this was the festival where they remember how God brought them out of Egypt. Never forget where God brought you from. That's why God said you are to remember this every year. Passover is when the blood of the lamb delivered them out of slavery and delivered them from death. Isn't that what Jesus did for us? He delivered us out of slavery to sin, and he delivered us from death. For in him we have eternal life. So this first festival was Passover. The second one was Pentecost. Pentecost is a time to remember the receiving of the word of God from Mount Sinai. Where God appeared to Moses and gave him the Ten Commandments. And Moses broke all Ten Commandments. Uh He broke them. But it's a time to remember the receiving of the word of God. Because God's commandments are life to us. They're not here to punish us. God's commandments are safety rails. To keep us and to protect us from destruction. No, what's amazing to me is that you look at the first Pentecost in the Old Testament. 3,000 people died for judgment by worshiping idols. But you look at the day of Pentecost in the book of Acts when the Holy Spirit was poured out. 3,000 people came to faith in Jesus and received eternal life when they heard the preaching of the gospel. Pentecost is a powerful time for us to remember not only the receiving of the word of God, but the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Then you had the third, third feast. It is the Feast of Tabernacles, and this is the weirdest one of all. It's where all of Israel would come and they would camp out for a week. They would build these little booths, these little tents, if you will, and they would live in these little huts for a week to remember the time that they were roaming in the wilderness. It's a time of remembrance. And you know, Ezekiel said that in the millennial reign of Christ, the whole world is going to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. That means that while we're ruling and reigning with Jesus, we're going to be a part of that too. Amen. Y'all better practice. Practice your your hut building. Amen. I I I think I'm going to have me a pizza hut. Amen. (laughs) But it was an Old Testament law 
Every Jewish man had to follow these Passovers, follow these festivals and make the trip to Jerusalem. So everybody was here for Passover, not just those living in Judea, okay, but all over the world. Everybody was gathered here in Jerusalem, okay? And here's an important detail. The people were required to offer sacrifices at Passover, And because many people either did not own livestock or because they traveled long distances, the priest in the temple had a system set up where where they would sell them the animals to be offered as sacrifices. Not only that, but they, they had a very convenient system set up because many of these people traveled from parts of the Roman Empire and even beyond, and, and they didn't have the, the temple coins. They had the currency where they came from, and these coins often had the image of pagan gods on them, and that was not allowed in the temple. So they would have to take their money and have it exchanged for currency that would be acceptable in the temple. So they had their own foreign currency exchange set up. So the animals and the money changers were stationed in the part of the temple called the court of the Gentiles. Who are the Gentiles? We the Gentiles. Unless you're Jewish, shalom. (laughs) Okay? But the Gentiles were non-Jewish people, and this was an enormous place. It it, it could hold roughly 75,000 people. I mean, this was stadium-sized area, and this is where they set up shop, and this is where Gentiles from all over the world could come, and they could be taught the scriptures, and they could learn how to worship God. It was a wonderful place, but there was some not so good stuff going on here. So Jesus shows up and he doesn't like what he finds. Jesus shows up and he sees that there's some shady stuff going on in the house of God. He finds out that the money changers are stealing from people because they're lying about the exchange rate. I don't know if y'all have ever traveled to another country, but this is very, very common. I mean, I'm no Albert Einstein, but I know I'm getting ripped off every time I go to a tourist place and I try to exchange American dollars for wherever I am because this is certainly not a one-to-one exchange rate. I'm like, come on, y'all got a dictator, you got inflation out of control. I know that one of my dollars is worth about 50,000 of your dollars, not 50 cents of your dollars. But they were ripping off people, they were stealing their money, and worse than that, people who brought their own animals for sacrifice, they were nitpicking the animals because you couldn't offer a sacrifice. You read the Old Testament, you know you can't bring a sacrificed animal without spot or without with a spot or blemish, right? So they were scrutinizing the animals and finding fault when no fault was there so they could sell them one of their animals at 30 times the price. They were robbing people and according to the jewish historian flavius josephus how you like that name that's a cool name flavius josephus yo that's like a rapper name it's the jewish rapper (laughs) approximately two y'all know flavor flavius (laughs) according to flavius josephus roughly two million people made this pilgrimage every year And the high priest and his cronies were raking in millions of dollars, ripping off the people of God. They were profiting off of the people they were supposed to be helping. They were literally becoming the barrier to the people from preventing them from worshiping God. Listen, God hates corruption. 
This grieved the heart of Jesus. It says in Matthew 21, 12, he went into the temple of God and he drove out all those who bought and sold in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. No wonder Jesus was mad. He saw what was going on. He saw that they were depriving people of freely worshiping God. And he said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer. But you have made it a den of thieves. Now, let me, let me tell you something amazing. This, this, this incident right here in the last week of the ministry of Jesus is found in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. But here's an amazing fact. This was not the first time Jesus had to do this. When you read... John chapter 2, you'll find out that at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, when he the first time he went to Jerusalem for Passover, he also drove out the money changers and turned over the tables in the temple. This was not the first time he had been here. This is significant because Jesus cleansed the temple at the very beginning and the very end of his ministry. So let's look at John chapter 2. John chapter 2, John 2, 13. It says, now the Passover of the Jews was at hand and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And he found in the temple those who sold oxen and sheep and doves and the money changers doing business. I love verse, verse, verse 15. And when he had made a whip of cords. <laughs> That's my Jesus. <laughs> my God could beat up your God for show. You don't see boot out there making whips. <laughs> when he made a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers' money, overturned the tables, and he said to those who sold doves, Take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. You know, I think sometimes because of Hollywood and maybe even children's books, we get the wrong impression about Jesus. Jesus is not a hippie prancing around throwing flowers at people. Amen. Jesus was bad to the bone. You don't mess with Jesus. Do you realize he went out and made his own whip? Y'all, Indiana Jones didn't even make his own whip. I'm just saying, Jesus is bad to the bone. He was tough. I mean, he was a carpenter. I mean, he was an old school carpenter. Like, they cut down the tree and make the beams from the tree, y'all. He was rough and tough, made his own whip. Christianity needs, needs more men like Jesus. Come on, some real men, y'all. Jesus saw injustice and he jumped in the fight and did something about it. Jesus dealt with the stuff that everybody else was desensitized to and was too afraid to speak up about. Jesus was passionate about the temple of God. Verse 16, and he said to those who sold doves, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a shopping mall. Then his disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house has eaten me up. Somebody say, Jesus cares about God's house. They remembered what was written in Psalm 69, verse 9. For zeal for your house consumes me, and the insults of those who insult you fall on me. You know, the people in the temple were a little bit shocked about what Jesus did. Wouldn't you be? If you go to church and this guy comes in and goes out and makes a whip and starts flipping over tables and chairs, I think I'd be a little uncomfortable. How about you? The religious rulers got upset. Verse 18, so the Jews answered and said to him, what sign do you show us since you do these things? Jesus answered and said to them, destroy this temple and in three days 
I will raise it up. They said, what you talking about, Jesus? They said, it's taken 46 years to build this temple, and you will raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. Therefore, when he had risen from the dead, his disciples remembered what he had said to them, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. Now, we live in a postmodern culture. Postmodernism rejects logic and reason and says that truth is relative. Postmodernism says I can have my truth and you can have your truth. And even though our truths are in conflict with one another, we're all right. Oh, baby, uh, that's so dumb. That is very dumb. <laughs> but we live in a relativistic society. That says there are many paths to God. We live in a society where a lot of different religions and a lot of different ways acknowledge Jesus as a prophet. But yet they don't believe his prophecy. You can't call him a prophet if you don't believe what he prophesied. Islam says Gee, they exalt Jesus as a prophet. Yet they don't believe his prophecy. What did Jesus say? We just read his greatest prophecy that destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. He said it again in Mark 8, 31. He began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the teachers of the law and that he must be killed and after three days rise Again, that was his prophecy. He prophesied his death and burial and resurrection over and over and over again. You know, if the Bible says something more than one time, you better pay attention. Because it's emphasizing the importance of it. Luke eleven twenty nine. 29. And while the crowds were thickly gathered together, he began to say, this is an evil generation. Oh, it's not just us. This happened before. Say, so y'all just calm down. It's going to be okay. It's not the first time. He began to say, this is an evil generation. It seeks a sign and no sign will be given to it except the sign of Jonah the prophet. What's the sign of Jonah? I'll let Jesus explain it. Matthew 12, 40. For as Jonah was in the belly of the great fish for three days and three nights, so will the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. Now look, listen to this. The people of Nineveh will stand up against this generation on judgment day and condemn it. For they repented of their sins at the preaching of Jonah. Now someone greater than Jonah is here. But you refuse to repent. My God. Jesus himself was preaching to them and still they didn't hear. Don't let that be you. Jesus told them, the only sign you'll be given is the sign of Jonah. He repeated this over and over and over again. When Jesus was baptized in the Jordan River, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit descended upon him like a what? Like a dove. What's the Hebrew word for dove? Jonah. Yona. The Hebrew word Jonah means dove. There's a strong Jonah-Jesus connection, y'all. But here's my main point today, and I want you to take this to heart, and, I, and I'm done, okay. But I, I, I want you to just open up your ears to hear and op open up your heart. I say this because I love you, and I want you to think about this, because I know that God interrupted my plans for this sermon, because this is for somebody this morning. In John chapter 2, Jesus turned over the tables in the temple. He cleansed the temple. And yet here in Matthew 21, three years later, he has to do the same thing again. And here's where it hits home. Is there something Jesus drove out of your life years ago that you've allowed to come back in? Is there something... That Jesus kicked out of your life, that he drove away years ago, that over time you've allowed that thing to creep back into your life and creep back into your heart and creep back into your mind. You see, every week of this series, 
I focused on a key part of what it means to be a Christian. This is Discipleship 101. Week one, you've got to forgive. Week two, you've got to have faith. You've got to be hungry for God. But today my message is repent. What does it mean to repent? It means to turn around and go the other way. Listen, no matter how far along you are in your faith, we all have things that we have to deal with. We have things that we have to address. And I know conviction is tough. And sometimes conviction is harder the longer you've served God. Because we think to ourselves, I've been serving God for X number of years. I'm farther along than that. I, I don't have a weakness. I don't have a fault. I don't have a flaw. I don't have a failure. But child of God, you do. Sometimes the longer you serve God, you, the more you avoid conviction. I mean, you avoid it like the cell phone salesman in Sam's Club. I mean, you're running down the mattress aisle to get away from them. Don't do that to the Holy Ghost. Humble yourself before God. Because, child of God, sometimes there are things that Jesus delivered us from when we were first starting out. That we've opened the door and we've allowed it through the cares of life, through the things that we've gone through, through discouragement, through frustration, through the political climate, through the economy, through struggles in our family and troubles at work. We've allowed those things an open door to come back in. And Jesus says it's time to turn, turn over some tables. It's time to cleanse the temple again. And that's God's message for somebody today because he loves you. So what's in your life today that Jesus says that doesn't belong there? Because your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus says, my, the, my, my zeal for God's temple consumes me. He cares about what's in here. He cares about what's in your life. What do you need to drive out of the temple courts today? Maybe it's doubt. Maybe it's anxiety. Maybe it's worry. Maybe it's unforgiveness. That's a tough one, y'all. That's a tough one. There are people who have hurt me deep, and I took it to the altar, and I cried, and I gave it to God. But when I'm stressed out and when I'm frustrated, isn't it easy for that bitterness to come up? For those emotions to well up? When I'm stressed out and I'm not doing well, isn't, isn't the temptation always there to start dwelling on those things? Maybe it's anger. I mean, we don't need a lot of help to get angry these days. Just turn on the news. Just, you know, Knock on your neighbor's door. I mean, it doesn't take much. Post a selfish post on social media. Oh, I just need some friends today. You get some mean comments. Maybe it's fear. Maybe it's greed. Maybe it's lust. Whatever it is. What area in your life did Jesus deliver you from that you've allowed to come back in? Whatever it is, don't let it keep you from Jesus. Because nothing is worth more than him. What's holding you back today? Because you know what Jesus called them? He called them thieves. That means that anything in your life that doesn't belong is a thief. And all it's going to do is rob you. It's going to rob you of sleep. It's going to rob your relationships. It's going to rob your finances. It's going to rob your peace of mind. It's time to turn over the table and kick out the thieves today. Anything in your heart that doesn't belong is stealing from you. Flip those tables today. It's time to get fed up in Jesus. Jesus got spitting mad. He got whipping mad, y'all. It's time to get a whip and Indiana Jones that bad boy out of your heart this morning. 
It's time to say enough is enough. I'm tired of the enemy robbing me of my peace of mind. I'm tired of the enemy wreaking havoc in my marriage, in my friendships, in my family, in my finances, in my health. It's time to kick out the thieves. And if you go back to Matthew 21, the Bible says, as soon as Jesus kicked out the thieves, you know what happened? He made room for the people who were sick to come in and he healed them. And that's the key. Maybe you've been praying for a breakthrough in your life. Maybe you've been believing God for healing for so long. Maybe that's the answer you need today. You've got to kick some stuff out to make room for Jesus to bring healing in your heart. So can we pray for just a moment and make some room for Jesus this morning? Can we stand as we pray? And in these moments, I just want us to reflect on what he was preaching about because this is a very powerful message. Amen. Lord, we just thank you, Father, for today. God, I thank you for every person that is in this room and that is listening online, Father, and that is in the parking lot, God. You have a destiny and you have a purpose. You've brought them from a long way. And Lord, this morning, I thank you, Father, that, that they remember where you brought them from, Father. God, that they remember how many times you've protected them, you've provided for them, and you've healed them, Father. That they're reminded that their salvation was not free. That there was a high cost that was paid for us to be saved. And God, right now, I just pray that hearts begin to be searched right now. God, that you show people what they got rid of before and what they've allowed back into their life now. Maybe they haven't even gotten rid of some things that they know they need to get rid of. But God, this morning you show them right now the things that are in their life that are robbing them of their peace that are robbing them of their healing, that are robbing them of their family, that are robbing them of their job and of their money, that are robbing them of their relationship in you. God, that you open up those blind eyes and that they see, Father, the things that they need to get rid of. And God, this morning, that obedience steps in where some of us have been very stubborn and we've wanted to hold on to that hurt and that unforgiveness and we want to wallow in it, that this morning we say, God, it is yours. That we stop allowing the enemy to rob us of our peace and of our destiny. That we take hold of what the enemy has tried to come in and control our thoughts with. That anxiety, that fear, that lust, that, uh, that addiction. Those hurtful words that have been said. Those things that you have said to hurt those. That this morning we remember, Father, Lord, that you forgive us. That you delivered us. And that we don't go back to Egypt. But that we focus on you. And God, this morning, I thank you for deliverance, Father. God, that as I was praying that you were showing people and people were seeing and they were having the thoughts of the things of where they were and, and how much passion they used to have and how they didn't used to allow this in their life. And then this morning they're seeing, I've allowed the enemy to come back into my life. Things that I was delivered from that I've come back into Egypt. And this morning I thank you that you are parting the Red Sea. And those things that you delivered people from, that you are going to deliver them from again this morning. That they're going to walk away from them and that they will not look back. That they will not pick back up that lust. They will not pick up that greed. They will not pick that unforgiveness back up. They will not pick that social media back up, that pornography, the addiction that you delivered them from, that they've tried to get back into, that they've made excuses for why it's okay. It's just a little bit. That the excuses stop this morning. That the justification stops. That that spirit of lying that has creeped back in, 
that spirit of laziness and lack of motivation, the spirit of fear that has gripped you, lay it at the altar. Give it back to Jesus because he paid the ultimate cost for us to be set free. And Lord, I thank you that who the Son sets free is free indeed. And all we have to do is ask, God, we need to be set free. And in the name of Jesus, we will become free if we let it go. And Lord, this morning, I thank you, Father, that people are letting things go. Things they've been holding on to. That thief that they won't let go of. God, this morning, I thank you that chains are being broken. That thoughts are being removed in the name of Jesus. That hearts that have been hardened are becoming soft and like flesh. That people are being set free this morning. And as they go back home, they make the choice not to go back. That they choose to walk in freedom and deliverance, Father. And Lord, I thank you for healing to come. That as soon as we walk away from those things and we turn the tables over in our life that need to be turned over, God, that healing comes into our life. That forgiveness comes in. That healing in the body comes in in the name of Jesus because by your stripes we are healed. And Lord, I proclaim that as people are letting go and walking away from things, Father, that they should not be involved in, God, that you're bringing healing into their life that homes are being put back together, that healing of sickness that they've been walking, to, walking through, that in the name of Jesus, instant healing. That families are being put back together, friendships, relationships, promotions that you've been praying for. You don't know what's been hindering you, but as soon as you let it go, God, I thank you, Father, that that, that promotion comes in the name of Jesus. And God, I thank you, Father, Lord, for healing among the church where so many have been hurt by the church and they try to hold on to it this morning God I thank you that they're letting go of it that they see that the church is made up of a bunch of, of, of men of people who are not perfect that we are not God but that we seek you and God, that they turn their eyes to you and they see that you are the only living God and that you are the only perfection and that they trust in you, Father. And Lord, I thank you for healing to take place in the name of Jesus. God, for hearts to be mended. And Lord, I pray for every person that does not know you. God, that you're dealing with their heart right now. God, that you're calling them back home. Lord, I thank you, Father, that you're just mending hearts and you're touching hearts. And I bind the work of the enemy in the name of Jesus. Devil, you have no place and no authority. And every ounce of power by the name of Jesus that he has given me, I curse everything that the enemy has placed over your life. Every generational curse, every ounce of bondage, Every thought of death. I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. And I speak freedom into your life. And Lord, we just thank you, God. And we praise you, Father, for your freedom. We thank you, Father, that you are the Son of God. And that you laid your life down for us, Father. And Lord, we just worship you right now in this moment. And Lord, as we lift our hands and surrender to you, God, those things that you reminded of us of, us of while I was praying, God, that right now, in the act of lifting our hands, we surrender it to you, Father. We lay them at your feet. No matter what it is, God, we give it to you. We give those burdens. We give that lust. We give that hurt. We give everything to you in the name of Jesus. And God, that as we lay these burdens to you, God, that you heal us in the name of Jesus. 
God, that you're bringing peace. Right now to hearts that need to be calmed. To minds that need to be calmed. To anger that needs to be driven out. That joy is coming into people's lives because your joy is our strength. That sadness and depression is being driven out right now as we act and surrender to you and lift our hands, Father. That anxiety is being driven out. Fear. Whatever it is that's been plaguing us, God, that you are healing us right now in these moments. And as we begin to sing in these next few moments, and we just worship you, Father, God, that you are here that you are with us. Let those chains fall off.
And as Christians, we need to be corrected because we live in a sinful world. And there are some of you that you need to go home and you need to turn the tables over in your house. You have allowed way too much in your home. You're allowing your kids to do things they should not be doing. They're playing video games. They're doing stuff. They're watching things. You're watching stuff that you have allowed the enemy a complete open door into your house. You opened up your front door and you said, come on in, devil. And you're crying and you're wondering, why am I being battled? Why is this going on? Because you opened up the door by allowing these things that are in your home. So today when you go home, you need to open up your refrigerator and some of you need to throw out that alcohol that you keep letting stay in your house that you know good and well it doesn't need to be in your house. You need to go home and you need to see what your children are doing. You need to go home and re-examine what you're looking at on TV and what you're looking at on the computer because those are things that are keeping you bound. And if you like staying bound, I pray for you. But I'm going to tell you what, I like walking in freedom and having peace in my home, having peace in my heart, peace in my mind. So it is worth me going home and throwing out some stuff and turning over some tables and taking a stand and saying, devil, in the name of Jesus, you will not do this in my house. This house, we will serve you and you will be number one. Nothing else will be number one and you need to shut that front door. And don't leave a crack in it. And maybe you don't know what it is. You need to go home and you need to pray. God, what is it that I need to get out? What is it that I am doing that I need to remove? What is it that I'm watching? What is it? What conversations? Who are my friends? My whole entire life, what is it that's keeping me bound? Because I used to have peace. And now I don't have peace. But the greatest peace we could ever have is the peace of knowing that we are going to go when we die and we go to heaven, that Jesus, we're going to see him again. And some of you don't have that promise because either you have walked away from God and you're living for the world and you're playing church or you've never made him the Lord of your life. And it is time to stop playing church. God doesn't play games with us, and we don't need to play games with God. It is time that we get serious and we serve him with our whole heart, and not a little bit of us on Sunday morning whenever praise and worship is good, the sound is good, or when I decided to get up this morning to come to church. Because when you're praying and you're asking God to answer your prayers, you're serious, and he's not playing. He listens to everything you say, but he wants you to draw near to him. So this morning, if you say, I need to rededicate my life to God, or maybe I don't know God, I want to give you the opportunity. I want everybody to repeat this prayer after me. Dear Jesus, I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. I believe in you. Save me. Set me free. Forgive me of my sins. Be the Lord of my life. And with your help, I'm going to live for you the rest of my life. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. How many are you so thankful that we serve a risen God, that he is a forgiving God, that he loves us with an everlasting love? Well, I'm going to ask our prayer team to come up front. If you need prayer, I encourage you, come up front. We're here to pray for you. We're here to agree with you. We want to lay hands on you and anoint you. If you got saved this morning, I want you to make sure you fill out your red cards. If you have a prayer request, if you want to get baptized next week, put it in the black boxes on the way out. Don't forget Wednesday night, we have Feed the Kids tonight at six, at, on Wednesday night at 630. And we have service and Bible study. Church, we love you. We are praying for you. Make sure you examine your life when you walk out of here. We love you and have a wonderful week.
say